if you jump to a conclusion and the conclusion is wrong, you don't get punished. If you jump to a conclusion and the conclusion is right, we reward you richly. Yeah. And if you're the person who waits for the evidence to come in, or you just follow the evidence as it comes in, we don't reward you at all. Adam Sells here for Rebel News, and we are on location at the Gray Eagle Event Center just outside of Calgary for Ben Shapiro Live. It is an event that is being hosted by the Wilberforce Project, a pro-life political organization that is active here in Alberta. As the name of the event suggests, the star of the evening will be Ben Shapiro, political pundit, co-founder of The Daily Wire, and host of The Ben Shapiro Show. We were very fortunate to secure an exclusive interview with the man himself. Well, uh, Ben, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Going to get straight into some questions here. I suppose my first question for you would be, we, we clearly live in a sort of world of double, double standard selective enforcement and that's glaringly obvious when you see it whether it whether it be BLM or pro Hamas protests they can shout genocidal slogans break stuff fight people do whatever they they wish there's no consequence by contrast we saw the freedom convoy that was entirely peaceful they received harsh treatment frozen bank accounts horse tramplings where did this sort of structural division come from? So I think that in the end, where it comes from is a false binary between oppressor and oppressed. And, and this really has its roots in Marxist theory. Uh, the, the idea that there's an oppressor class and there's an oppressed class and the more unsuccessful you are, the more oppressed you therefore are and you've been exploited by the system. You're not responsible for your own failures. That's the, that's the fault of the system. And then that got grafted in the last 40, 50 years right. away from class and onto race. And so the idea then was, if you're a member of a race, that race earns less than other races, for example. You are now a member of an oppressed race, and that means that you've been exploited, and you can then do anything you want to the oppressor class. Yeah. And it got grafted onto a sort of decolonization narrative that was originally pushed by Franz Fanon and Jean-Paul Sartre, and, and kind of bled its way both down and up. And so now what you see is this idea that if you are a pro Hamas protester, then this means that you're fighting the oppressor, and therefore you can do literally anything up to and including slaughtering babies in their cribs, and everybody will basically be okay with that. Whereas if you are a disproportionately white group of people who are protesting because your jobs have been taken away from you, right. then you're part of the oppressor class. It doesn't matter if you are not wealthy. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. You're part of the oppressor class because you've participated in the capitalist system, and because you even have a job, and because of your color. And, and that, that really is truly ugly stuff. Now, another group that would certainly participate in this oppression language um, would be the sort of anti-hate groups or the uh, even diversity inclusion type groups on campuses and workplaces right across the board even in government one of the things that I've noticed lately though is that there's been a sort of concerted shift uh, if, if say a Muslim group is, is shouting anti-Semitic slogans um, or a BLM protest is shouting anti-white slogans that's completely fine these groups seem to exclusively target even the most minor instances of inappropriateness by the people who wouldn't be considered oppressed yeah that, that, that's right I mean the, the, the because it's a, it's a power game. And I think that we grant their premise when we pretend that there's an actual legitimate shred of truth to the thing that they're saying. Yeah. It isn't, it's a power struggle. And they say this, they say all institutions are, insti are, are creations of, of power dynamics. They say that, that everything up to and including things like freedom of speech are a reflection of underlying power dynamics. And that really is projection. The, the way they think about everything is in terms of power dynamics. And so they are exercising power over you by claiming victimhood when they're not actually victimized. And then they're expecting you to, to bow to them and come, come to heal. And, and that's the, the more offended you are and the more you cave to that, the more power they have. And that's why the only answer to it is to basically throw up a middle finger and say, you're not oppressed and I'm not oppressing you and you're just yeah. gonna have to deal with that. Now, since what we've seen since the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel, uh, do you think that President Trump was right to suggest uh, that, that places with high risks of terrorism, that we should be ceasing all immigration from those places or outright banning it? Yes, I mean, I, I thought that he was right when he said it. I mean, the, 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 the location-based immigration ban was, was not only correct, it was in place for part of the Obama administration. I mean, right. there, there were certain places where you just cannot vet people from those places. Now, it doesn't have to be religion specific. And this was the difference between some of the stuff that Trump originally said and then what it ended up being. So right. what he originally said was like, Muslim ban, nobody gets in if you're Muslim. And I said, well, that's a little overbroad. I mean, there, there are certainly moderate Muslims who you might want to let in your country. If they're well qualified, they add to the country, they, they can get a good job and all the rest of that sort of thing. But, you know, when it comes to countries like how do you know who the hell's coming in from Syria? Yeah. How do you know who's coming in from the Gaza Strip? And, and the idea of widespread immigration availability from countries that have cultures that are not remotely like Western cultures, and in fact, cultures that, that deeply hate Western cultures, yeah. that's a horrible idea. I saw, I saw a poll out actually today uh, of Palestinians in the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip, and it found that 75% of them approved of the October 7th attacks. And when it came to you know what, what percentage of them wanted to obliterate the state of Israel completely, it was in the high 80s. Yeah. So the, all, all, this, all this talk about how 
it's a bunch of moderate, peace-loving people. It doesn't mean that they're members of Hamas and they're not being targeted like members of Hamas. Israel's doing a good job of, of trying to avoid that. But it does mean that pretending all populations hold the same belief system is ridiculous. No, so if, if folks are newcomers to a country, they haven't acquired citizenship yet, if they're participating in violent protests or calling for genocidal eradications, out. They should go, them they right should away. go, 100%. Yeah. We, have, we have no obligation in the West to ship in people who hate our civilization or who identify with terrorist groups. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Why, why do you think it is that Justin Trudeau, I mean, lots of the sort of woke leaders in the world are so partial uh, or at least deferential towards Hamas uh, and, and maybe even a bit critical of Israel? Uh, I think that, again, that oppressor oppressed matrix cannot be undermined under any circumstances in their viewpoint. Yeah. Israel is a quote unquote oppressor state specifically because it is a successful Western state yeah. in a very unsuccessful region of the world. And so when, when Justin Trudeau and a lot of people like him look at the Israelis versus the Palestinians, they don't see a long history of conflict with one side legitimately stating they would have to obliterate the other completely. Well, what they see instead is very powerful, large military, uh, many white people, and on the other side, many poor brown people. Yeah. And because of that, that means that the Israelis are inherently the bad guys, and they must have done something exploitative in order to create that binary. And thus, that the best thing to do is weapons down, that, that'll bring back the peace, negotiations, diplomacy. Now, you can say that that's ignorant, and it may be. For a lot of people, it may be ignorant. Uh, it can also be malicious, because there comes a certain point where, I mean, when you're talking about a group that literally slaughters babies in their cribs and rapes women and drags them back to the hellhole that is Gaza. At, at that point, I think negotiations should probably be off the table. I don't, I don't see exactly why that, that should be a matter of moral equivalence. Right. Now, Trudeau has embraced the sort of Marxist mentality on every single issue on a level I think is probably unrivaled by any leader in the world, potentially. Um, and he does this despite the fact that there's massive backlash both at home and abroad. G7 allies, Five Eyes allies. Uh, the international community doesn't look at Canada in the same way it does. Why are political leaders like him so ideologically and dogmatically married to progressive agendas, even when everyone's saying, please, just stop. I think there's a sense in which it makes them feel very good about themselves. Uh, I think there, there's something very self-flattering about dissociating from you know, the, the elite class and saying, well, I, you know, but I'm not like them. Yeah. I'm not like them. I'm, I'm really, I'm, my own, I'm with you. I'm with the oppressed people. Yeah. And, you know, I know that I'm privileged. And Justin Trudeau's a very privileged human yeah. being, one of the most privileged human beings ever to walk the earth. And, and so for him and for a lot of people who are like that, the way that you shed yourself of the privilege is by trying to ally yourself with the oppressed and the marginalized. And so he's certainly doing that in, in heavy measure. Uh, handsome Bernie Sanders is what I've been calling him for years uh, on, on the program, and, and he is a disgrace to his office, and I look forward to him leaving. Now, to what extent, obviously 84% of Canadians want new leadership, to what extent do you think that these people actually believe that, and to what extent are people within their office or they themselves simply use, utilizing the language of the left to achieve their ends? Um, I, I think that there's a hardcore base that actually understands what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, and then I think there are a lot of fellow travelers who, who, and this is one of the great sins of the West, who are just trying to be nice. Yeah. Saying, I just don't want to be offensive. You know, you, you, what, is it really nice to call out people when they say that they feel oppressed? Is it nice to tell them that they're not yeah. and that really they should get their act together and as Jordan Peterson says, make your bed? Like, is that, is that a nice thing to say? And, and that niceness is really dangerous because when you say to people, I'm too shy to tell you to you know, get your act together, what you're really saying is you think they're incompetent. You think they're, they're foolish. You think that you need to paternalistically take care of them and fix their life for them. Yeah. Um, and it makes a lot of people feel good about themselves and it makes them, a lot of people feel like they're being virtuous. Um, but the reality is that the people you're closest to tend to be also the people you give the most correctives to. The members right. of your family are the people who you say, well, you know, you could do X better. Yeah. I, I say this to my kids all the time. Like they, they come home from school and they didn't do great on a test. And I'll be like, well, that's why we need to study. Let's sit yeah. down, we'll study right now. Like, it's not nice to say to my kid, you know, you did your best. You're actually kind of dumb. Like, you got to see. And you're going to get C's from here on out because, let's face it, and uh, we're going to make provision for you. Like, that would be a terrible thing yeah. to do as a parent. <laughs> an awful, evil thing to do as a parent. But we do, it as a, but we do, do that as a society. Well, you're kind of touching on fraternal correction there. And a question that I have for you, uh, we, we talk a lot about sort of the left's disconnect from reality. Um, but we have seen, I mean, especially we have, to, we have to work on our credibility in Canada. We're fighting state-funded media giants. Um, so we have to be careful. But we have seen a number of pundits around the world on the conservative side who sometimes embrace maybe or go down ideological rabbit holes that aren't evidence-based. So you, you're kind of known for saying facts over feelings, how critical is it for people on the right or conservatives to be sure that they're self-examining and that they're checking their own confirmation bias? I, mean, I think that on a moral level, I think very, very serious. I think that we, we have an incentive structure that rewards fast over correct. Yeah. So right, right now, the way that it tends to work is that if you jump to a conclusion and the conclusion is wrong, you don't get punished. If you jump to a conclusion and the conclusion is right, we reward you richly. Yeah. And if you're the person who waits for the evidence to come in, 
or you just follow the evidence as it comes in, we don't reward you at all. So your incentive structure is very strong to be the person who jumps out in front of the parade and mm -hmm. takes the most extreme possible position because you might be right. I mean, it's actually very reminiscent of an old scam that used to get run in the United States and was made illegal as a mail scam. And the basic idea was uh, that there, there'd be a, yeah, uh, ten. There, there'd be uh, a one football game on on a Sunday, and they this the scamster would take ten thousand, ten thousand pieces of mail, and send five thousand to a group yeah. saying that Team A would win, and five thousand to a group saying Team B would win, and one of those teams would win, yeah. and then he would take the subset of the team that won and do the same thing the next week, and it would gradually winnow down. But by the time he got to like game six or game seven. There's a subset of those people who had gotten only right answers, right? And then they would buy into it. They're, oh my gosh, this guy's un he's infallible. There's yeah. no way he could possibly, he could possibly miss. Yeah. And th that dynamic really does apply to a lot of the grift that's going on politically. And th that's strong on all sides. It's not just the right. For sure. You know, finally, I guess my question for you is we've seen the pendulum swing uh, very dramatically towards the left, towards progressivism. There's things today that the left would have condemned 10, 15 years ago uh, categorically. Um, have things gone too far, whether it's the attack on parental rights, transitioning minors, uh, the unconditional up to nine months abortion uh, laws we're seeing, have they gone too far to the point where the pendulum is going to start to swing back? Will sanity prevail? I mean, I, I think that it will, but first party to sanity wins. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that, that um, I'm going to mispronounce the name of the conservative candidate here. Um, what was it Olivier? Pierre Polyevre, yeah. Polyevre, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so he's terrific. Like, he, he's really good. Uh, he's really articulate. Uh, he, he seems to, you know, be in control of his faculties, which is more than we can say for most of our politicians <laughs> in the United States. Uh, and that, that's really good. But what, what we say in, in the United States, what I've said on the show a lot, uh, is first party to sanity wins. And part of the problem is that as the right gets driven out of its mind by the left, they tend to think, okay, well, we can't nominate somebody who's going to be sane. We need to nominate somebody who's crazy, man. We need to nominate somebody who's going to knock their block off. It's like, well, then that person has to get elected. Yeah. And is that person more likely to get elected or less likely to get elected? And so basically in the United States right now, what you have is this bizarre dynamic where both parties are certain that their guy cannot possibly lose to that guy, right. which is actually a really bad dynamic because that means you can run literally anyone. You can yeah. run like, you know, a geriatric daughter who can't speak words from his, from his face hole, or you can run, you know, a guy who's going to face four indictments next year and is, and is tweeting randomly in capital letters. Like those, those could or be your Captain candidates. Sox. Right, oh, right, exactly. <laughs> like it, you, you can run pretty much because there's no way you're going to lose to that guy. That, that's yeah. a very bad approach. The American people, by the way, deeply dissatisfied with it. You can look at the polling data. The, yeah. the, the, we have the same issue in the United States you do here. It's not just that 80% of people in the United States are, are dissatisfied with the current government. It's more like 70%, 70, you know, 65%. Yeah. But the number of people who are dissatisfied with the choice being presented to them politically is almost 100%. Yeah. Everybody's like, what is this? Like, this is awful. And yet the people who are going to be nominated are likely to be the people who are, um, you know, the, the most, the most, I'd say embodying of the of the id right. of, of politics as opposed to the reason of politics. The, the first party to sanity wins. Yeah. Well, hopefully we're headed there both in politics and in, in life in general. Things are pretty unhinged right now. Uh, ben Shapiro, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure. I want to thank the Wilberforce Project as well for, for allowing us to have this interview. And for everyone at home, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. For Rebel News, I'm Adam Sos. Hey guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in once again. I just want to ask you to consider if all your bills are in order, if you've got a little bit extra, if you could just consider chipping in a few bucks at rebelfieldreports.com. Things are costing more than ever. Getting out here, providing the equipment, doing these interviews, there are costs associated with it. We don't get handouts from the government like the mainstream outlets. So again, go to rebelfieldreports.com to chip in.